everyone. Welcome to episode 181 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We wanted to start off today's episode with thanks to all of our listeners and patrons and sponsors. We appreciate you all and are so grateful for your listenership and your financial contributions. It really helps. It's really nice to know people are out there listening. When we first started, we didn't think anyone would ever listen. Right. And now we hear from you on occasion. So we know if somebody's listening. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so thank you so much for doing that. We also want to say congratulations to Ryan in California, who was our April Patreon winner of a book. Ryan won our Patreon giveaway. Congrats, Ryan. And when we give things away, they're books. <laughs> Every 10th episode, we give away books. The winner of the episode 180 giveaway was an author, which is so fun. That's so cool. Yeah. Judy Prescott Marshall wrote a book called Still Crazy and some others. Check her out online and in the show notes. She won two books herself that we're sending her way. Awesome. Congrats. To York. Congrats to you both. I hope you enjoy it when you get around to them. Yeah. Sorry we're adding to your TBRs, but how does it go? Sorry, not sorry. Mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> so Emily, what are you currently reading? I am reading a cookbook. I did get to meet this author when I was at the Cherry Bomb Jubilee in New York a couple weekends ago. And the cookbook is called Boudmo. Recipes from a Ukrainian Kitchen by Anna Voloshina. Budmo, I'm just going to read to you what it means. Oh, good. I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, she has a great glossary. Like she also has an ingredient glossary, but this is more just things that are specific to Ukrainian places and words that we might not be familiar with. And so Budmo means cheers. When we drink in Ukraine, instead of saying cheers, we say budmo, which literally means let us be. It is a compelling word that contains a wish for good health, prosperity, and the enjoyment of being present in the moment. And it's not just used for drinking. She uses it throughout the book of have a good time is really how she uses it. Oh, this book is so beautiful. Anna is a food stylist and photographer herself, mm -hmm. as well as being a chef. So the pictures are so compelling. It makes me think of you a lot, Chris, because it's pickled cabbage and fish and things that I know you grew up eating and really enjoy as well. I am currently trying to make cheese, which I've never done. She has a great recipe for sear or tavorug cheese. And it's like a soft, white, crumbly, fresh cheese. Mm. So it's sitting on my stovetop right now. It's milk and kefir mixed together, brought up to temperature, and then now it basically has to curdle. Oh, wow. Yeah. How many days will it sit there? Depends on the temperature of your kitchen, which my kitchen is quite chilly these days, but 24 to 36 hours. So I'm thinking mine will probably be closer to the 36. And then you heat it back up and then put it in cheesecloth and let the curd separate from the whey and go from there. So oh, fascinating. Yeah, it's like doing a little science project. I love it. It's just a beautiful book. I literally sat down and just started reading from page one and am about three quarters of the way through. Very cool. Again, that's called Budmo Recipes from a Ukrainian Kitchen by Anna Voloshina. Well, I'm reading a surprise book. I had heard about this author. She passed away very young. She was only 37 when she died, Rachel Held Evans. And she's a Christian thinker. And when she passed away, I remember thinking, oh, she sounds really interesting. Her work sounds really fascinating. I'd like to check her out. What brought her to mind recently was that Sharon Salzberg mentions her in her book, Real Life. We just talked with Sharon Salzberg. Our interview with her is at the end of this episode. So I thought, I want to read something that has nothing to do with anything right now, because tapping out with school here really soon. So I looked to see what our library had in terms of ebooks, and they had a copy of Inspired, Slaying Giants, Walking on Water, and Loving the Bible Again. And this came out in 2018. And I'm looking at my note here. Talk about a really sad synchronicity. She died on May 4th, 2019. And today's May 4th as we're recording, which is really surprising. 
she was ill and she had an allergic reaction to antibiotics that caused swelling in her brain and it was really unexpected. Her dad taught at a Christian school, so she grew up in a very Christian evangelical home and loved the Bible as a kid and acted out stories from the Bible with her sister and just really loved it. When she went to college at a Christian school, she started really not liking it and really being conflicted about the contradictions in it and the way that people use the Bible to do cruel things and to justify cruel things. So she kind of fell out of love with it. And this book is about that. So it's partial memoir and partial a retelling of some of the stories. And I'm just like a third of the way into it, maybe. And she talks about how really with the Bible, it's your intention. If you're coming to it to make a point, you can find justification for everything from slavery to not slavery. What really matters is what questions you're coming to it with and why. That's where I am at this point in the book anyway. So I do know that she did leave the evangelical faith and became an Episcopalian because she didn't like this direction that the evangelicals were going in. Again, that is inspired by Rachel Held Evans. Sounds really good. You know what? I should add one more thing. Like one of the things she talks about different faiths, and she talks about how in the Jewish faith, they don't take the Bible literally. It's more about having arguments and conversations about what did this mean and why and what was going on and laughing as well about things. It's refreshing to think about how different faiths use the Bible. Right. And mm-hmm. what it does to the cultures. Mm-hmm. So sad that she died so young. You wonder what else she would have written. Yeah. You know? Well, she yeah. wrote a fairly good amount for her age, I think. And she was so influential. And that's why when she passed away and the outpouring on social media was really quite intense. I'm reading and listening to Enchantment, Awakening Wonder in an Anxious Age by Catherine May. I'm going to stop for one second and say that we got an email from our listener, Linda, in Berkeley, signing up for our next read-along Zoom discussion. And she said that she read the book hybridly. And I thought, what a great way to say that you both listened to it and read the print. That's great. I like that. And or the e-reader, you know, hybrid reading. I think we should adopt that. I love that. So Catherine May is going to be our guest on episode 182. So both of us are reading this book. This one I've already read. I read it before it was published as an e-arc. So I'm enjoying the fact that now it's available on audio and in paper so I can put stickies on it and write in it and all of that. But this is Catherine May's going through the time of COVID and feeling a little bit lost, not even being able to read. Just makes me gasp to think about that figuring out that part of what she was looking for was to get back in touch with awe and being interested in the world through that lens. The book is broken up into four sections, earth, water, fire, and air. And just like she did with her book, Wintering, she weaves her own stories and stories of other powerful people and thinkers in time and space. I really loved this book. I read it at a time that was really important to me. And I'm finding the reread is even better Mm because I understand the concept of what she was trying to do with it. I think that's all I'm going to say about it because we're going to be talking about it in much more depth next episode. Yeah. You know what? It's funny. I looked at that book this morning. I just happened to be sitting at my desk and kind of gathering my books for my trip this weekend to Booktopia. And that's what I'm taking. And I opened it and I just started reading because it captured me right away. And it's a scene where she's first at college and she walks into her advisor's office and it's filled with books. And she's just in awe of these books and this woman professor who was just so sharp and just how overwhelmed she got with reading for college and learning how to read academic books and how she almost gave up. I just read that section. Yeah, it's very permissive in the sense of also recognizing that we have times in our lives and different than wintering, but times where we're just out of step with who we want to be, uh, offering ourselves forgiveness. She talks about how many jobs she's 
gone through and feeling badly about that and then just realizing I'm a human being Mm -hmm. living in the world and that's what happens. Well, yeah, it made me think too, that scene anyway that I'm talking about, it made me think of having a beginner's mind, Mm -hmm. you know, which some Buddhist thinkers talk about quite a lot in that she's using her finger to trace the lines, just Mm -hmm. like she did when she was learning how to read. She's learning how to read differently and that it's good to have that mindset to really just sit down and grapple with something because you want to move in that direction in your life. Yeah. 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 I'm looking forward to talking with all three of us about it. (laughs) Again, that's called Enchantment, Awakening Wonder in an Anxious Age by Catherine May. It's out now on all versions of whatever hybrid taking in you want to do. Right. Yes. (laughs) Bookish consumption. Bookish consumption. There you go. Well, to keep on with the Catherine May bandwagon here, I'm currently listening to Wintering. It's my first go around and I'm really enjoying it very much. It's narrated by Rebecca Lee. I had no idea what to expect. I know you read it and you talked about it and it sounded really good and I was looking forward to reading it. So having her on as a guest is obviously compelling me to get to it and I'm enjoying it. It was really funny. I took my car through the car wash yesterday and so I turned the volume up really loud (laughs) so I could still hear it while the car was being whooshed about And then I'm driving home and I'm like, why is it so loud? (laughs) So anyway, um, funny listening story, but enjoying it very much. And that's about her story of her husband becoming ill and her own illness and trying to figure out what was going on. And then her son's struggle with school. And it's just such a compassionate book, Mm -hmm. I think, really, even though she's harsh with herself. But you know she's hard with herself because she's figuring it out. And it's very relatable. Yes, 100%. The only thing I didn't relate to was her whole wolves and winter thing. Mm. I don't associate wolves with winter, so Mm. I'll have to ask her about that. Yeah, I think I would. But I'd have to read the context of what she was talking about. I mean, there's this horrific scene in a Willa Cather story about this sleigh in Russia that has a bride and a groom in it and these wolves come out and start chasing them. And finally, one of the guys throws the bride over (laughs) for the wolves to eat, you know, just lessen the load. Of course, the woman goes, anyway, horrific story. decided he didn't really want to be married, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) I think it was not the husband. I don't remember the the order of people being thrown over. But um, yeah, so maybe I just repress my wolfish wintering. I don't know. Yeah. My favorite part about that whole conversation, Chris, is that you couldn't even go the three minutes in the car wash without listening to your book. So you had to turn it up. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best, which I can totally relate to. (laughs) So yeah, it's a really good audio book if you want to consume it that way. Yeah. So again, that's Wintering by Catherine May. And this ends the Catherine May section of this podcast. (laughs) Until episode 182. So what have you just read? I finally got my hands on a copy of Luli and the Language of Tea by Andrea Wang with pictures by Juan Yum. This book is so sweet. Reminder to people that Andrea Wang is also the author of Watercress. And we had her on, boy, last spring, I think. So we'll put that in the show notes when she was on last. I just wanted to show Chris, it is a book about a little girl who goes into her preschool and is having a really hard time fitting in. And the way that she finally learns to fit in is to offer her fellow classmates tea. And then she discovers that no matter where you're from, the word for tea is pretty similar. It's one of those books, as a lot of kids books are, where you get to learn a lot. So she has them saying tea in the different languages. So it's like, Chi by Anaya said in Hindi. In Chai? Asked Karam in Turkish. Chai? Naku said in Persian. Shai? Asked Hakim in Arabic. So that gives you an idea of, you know, she makes a call that pe- to, for people to join her to tea. And then all of her classmates say tea in their language. And then at the end of the book, she has a really nice little note from the author about children and languages in this story and gives a really nice rundown of the different kids and where they're from. And it's just a delight. Super sweet. The pictures are beautiful. 
and welcoming, mm. I think. Yeah. Very cool. I'd love to read that. Yeah. I had this funny thing happen where I put this on request months ago. I mean, probably over a year ago. And it kept saying in transit. Mm. And finally, I realized like something's just wrong here. Mm -hmm. So I canceled it, put it back on hold from the library, and it came in in a week. Mm, interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. So again, that's called Luli and the Language of Tea by Andrea Wing. Just a beautiful little children's book. That's great. And what does that orange sticker on it say from the library? It says school stories. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't oh. know what that means. Oh, that must just be a genre of stories for kids. Well, it does take place in a school setting, yeah. so that makes That's sense. That's neat. Yeah. I like that. I haven't seen a book marked that way before. Well, I also read a picture book. I'm so grateful for ebooks from the library. So lovely. And picture books are great that way on an iPad or even computer screen because you get to see all the colors and everything. I read The Smart Cookie by Jory John, illustrated by Peter Oswald. And this is part of the food group series that I've enjoyed so much. Like there's The Bad Seed, which is my favorite of them so far. But The Smart Cookie is about a little cookie who doesn't feel so smart. And I related to her in some scenes there was this one and i posted it on social media of her in class feeling like there were times when she didn't know what was going on at all and she felt like her desk was at sea and she was all alone and there were sharks swimming around her desk in the picture Aww. so it's a really sweet book this whole series is it deals with different things that kids deal with yeah. And adults as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we always say picture books are not just for kids. No. And when you're super busy or stressed out, there's such a balm. Oh, it's so true because I was just so tired one night and I haven't been reading as much as I'm used to, but I wanted to just sit on the couch and read something. And Luli was perfect for that. Yeah. It was perfect. And then I was like, okay, now I can go to bed. I've had my bedtime story. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, they're good stories. They're visually just delightful. Yeah. And I noticed that when I was at Barnes and Noble, uh, probably a couple months now, since I've had a good browse, but they had a whole display of the food group books. So oh, there nice. are quite a few of them out now. Yeah. So check them out. That was The Smart Cookie by Jory John and Pete Oswald. Yes. So I listened to a book that is only available on audio. It's called Wild and Precious, a celebration of Mary Oliver, narrated by Sophia Bush. Wow. I have no idea how I found out about this book. I might have just been browsing audiobooks. I did listen to it via Hoopla through the library. It's four and a half hours, and it is a beautiful celebration of the poetry of Mary Oliver. And this is from Pushkin Studios, which is owned by the author Malcolm Gladwell. So he's putting out audiobooks that are a mixture of conversation and audiobook. In this case, they weren't reading from page one to page whatever of a Mary Oliver poetry book. What they were doing was reading her poetry in snips and pieces or sometimes in full, and then having people comment on what her poetry meant to them. Mm. And it was narrated, maybe the better way to say is hosted and narrated by Sophia Bush, who I'm not very familiar with. I guess she's pretty famous. I think she's an actress and an activist. The people who came in and out were Susan Cain, Samin Nosrat, Ross Gay, Rain Wilson, among many others. And it was so well done. And they even talked to her neighbors and some students she had at Bennington. It was very good. If you're a fan of Mary Oliver, I would say this is a must listen. If you're not used to listening to audiobooks, it's very entertaining. So I think it would be a fun experience as your first audiobook because it isn't just someone reading a story. It's, right. it's a almost, conversation. It sounds almost like a podcast. Exactly. More than an audiobook, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they also have some snippets of Mary Oliver reading her own poetry mixed in. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I love that. It was beautiful. I finished it and went right back to the beginning and started listening to it again. So highly recommend. Again, it's called Wild and Precious, a celebration of Mary Oliver, narrated by Sophia Bush, and it's available on all the audiobook platforms. Nice. Well, the only other thing I read was Real Life 
by Sharon Salzberg. Right on. We both read this book and we're going to have a conversation for you at the end of this episode with Sharon. The subtitle is The Journey from Isolation to Openness and Freedom. Right. One of the main themes that she talks about is contraction versus spaciousness. That's what she starts out talking about, which has a huge impact on our ability to be free with ourselves, free to journey and travel and learn. So that was one of the main themes that I wanted to say that she talked about and opens the book with. Yes. And similar to, as you said, with Catherine May, she takes different scholars and students of different aspects of psychology and living and incorporates that into how she's talking about these concepts, which I appreciated. And again, that's where I ran into Rachel Held Evans again, but so many fascinating tidbits of information and then really big concepts. One of the things we didn't get to talk to her about was the issue of shame and how that impacts us. So she quotes a psychologist named Eve Ekman who wrote, the brain filled with shame cannot learn. Mm -hmm. And I was underlining exclamation points Mm -hmm. next to that. And then Sharon writes, Remember, we are looking toward behavior change, and learning is a crucial component of that. And I thought that is just so tremendous and huge to think about, Mm -hmm. because shame is such a big part of life for many of us. Mm -hmm. And if shame interferes with your learning and behavior change and striving to live a better life, to have self-growth, if that's impeding you, you are just kind of stuck on a hamster wheel. That's not her imagery, but that's what made me think of it is that your life is constricted. You're not living an expansive, open life. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. When we talked with her on Zoom, I showed her my book (laughs) and I said, because I have about, I don't know, a hundred post-it notes. And I said to her, we have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Totally. (laughs) I mean, I listened to this book on audio, which she reads, and I Mm -hmm. really enjoy her voice is very calming. So now that I've read it, actually, when Laura was out of town last week, and I was having some trouble falling asleep, I put that on. Mm -hmm. And once I know the content of something, it's much easier to fall asleep. But I would find myself pausing it, running to the book, finding the section of the book and putting a sticky tab there because it was something that I wanted to come back to and really think about and potentially ask her a question about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find I'm listening to it off and on just when I need to be calmed down too. Because in the back, she also offers some really nice advice about meditation in the appendix because Sharon is very well known for that, leading meditations And she has a loving kindness meditation that we took her out with at the end. I find I've been using it a lot lately with myself. Basically, it's may I be safe, happy, healthy, live with ease. And she mentions in the book, you know, you can also use it at a time if you're feeling anger or I think she used an example where she was being impatient with somebody. So I was at the Y the other day in the locker room and someone was doing something really annoying. And I just was like, may I be safe? Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. May I be safe? Be happy. And it worked. I mean, I was like, I'm not mad at this lady. Why should I be mad at her? She's just living her life just like me. So we all need to be walking around doing that (laughs) loving kindness meditation. Yeah, I I enjoy the book. I've read others by her and have really enjoyed the way she presents information. Mm -hmm. I've read other Buddhist thinkers as well, and some are a little bit more esoteric than others. Impenetrable might even be a word to use, (laughs) Um, not to name names or anything, but her books are very approachable. Yeah. She is one of the first women American Buddhists to write books, Mm -hmm. which was very groundbreaking. Yeah. And pretty young, which is also very cool. She said she looked around and saw that the men were doing it. Why couldn't she? Mm -hmm. So she did. And she talks about that. So we highly recommend it. This is one of the books in her real series, Real Happiness, Real Love, Real Change, and Now Real Life. Really good. Just one more example from the book. She gave an example from the Dalai Lama saying to somebody, that's just wrong, the way the person was thinking and how people were upset about that. It's like, well, pedagogically, you shouldn't tell somebody that they're wrong. And he went on to explain, and it was about potential. 
he had said that potential exists inside every person for growth and change and that potential doesn't have to be earned. It just is. Yeah. Just claiming that and doing the work to change your behavior, to get out of your own way is I think one of the missions that Sharon has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And her version of storytelling and examples really helps you understand the concepts. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that she presents herself as not perfect. Yeah. She is a teacher, but she's still a student (laughs) of these ideas and techniques and the foibles of being a human being. Yes. I was listening to an interview with her podcast, the Meta Hour podcast, and she said, being a human being is really hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that totally sums it up. And that's what she's just trying to help us with, with these books. Yeah. Her podcast is one that I hadn't been listening to, but I subscribed recently. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. So that was Real Life by Sharon Salzberg. Stick around at the end and you'll hear a, a lovely conversation with her. This episode is sponsored by The Cost of Electricity, the story of a coming of age love triangle set at the University of Oregon in 1902. Lulu, the daughter of pioneers, aspires to be modern as free to love as the romantic poets, and as committed to equality as the suffragettes. Lulu's journey from the University of Portland, where she edits a literary magazine, to Hollywood, where she faces down her demons, reveals the challenges and rewards of a new century. The Cost of Electricity by Katherine Holzman is available now. Visit the show notes for episode 181 for links to the book and more information about Katherine Holzman. Chris, did you go on any Biblio adventures? Well, I did. I had that virtual Biblio adventure to Red Cloud, Nebraska. Uh, The Cather Center has a series called Reading Cather at 150, a virtual study series. And this is with author Benjamin Taylor, who is talking about four different novels of Cather's. And he started with My Antonia. He's a biographer of Cather. His biography is coming out later this year. But the 150 is that it's the 150th anniversary of Cather. So this series is part of that. And I enjoyed it very much. It's a novel I'm really familiar with. I think one of the cool things is just hearing somebody else's passion for a novel that you love. And then they do take Q&As too in these sessions. So I enjoyed it very much. Nice. I had a virtual Couch Biblio adventure watching Judy Bloom Forever on Amazon Prime. This is a newly released documentary about Judy Bloom. It's somewhat similar to that audiobook I was just talking about, about Mary Oliver, where the difference is Judy Bloom is still alive. So they did interview her and take a walk down memory lane of her childhood and her marriages, but they interspersed it with people reading bits of Judy Bloom books and showing the books and telling them why they were so important to them. And that was really fun. They even showed old footage of her at bookstores signing books and talking to kids. Some of the gasp inducing things back in the day that she would talk about. And some of her appearances on network television where she would be taken to task about her writing, things like that. So they really cover a lot of the bases. And one of the things that was poignant and frightening at the same time was going back and showing when her books were banned, quote, back in the day, and then talking to her now about her books being banned. And she was saying how different it is now, because now it's really coming from the government. And that is a real change in how it was when her books first started being banned. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. They Mm -hmm. also showed her in her bookstore in Key West, and she they are very committed to having all banned books available there and, you know, having a display at all times because the banned book thing kind of cycles, different books appear there. So they're committed to having banned books for sale there. Yeah. If you want to support an organization that's helping to open minds and help combat banned books, every library is a great organization for that. Indeed. We'll put a link in the show notes to that because They're finding so many people, most Americans, the large majority of them, do not support banning books. Mm -hmm. One person shouldn't be allowed to remove a book from an entire library. 
I totally believe in a parent's right to choose for their child, obviously. But if you don't want your child to do it, doesn't mean other children shouldn't have access to it. Right. And one of the things every library does is really pay attention to local politics, which is where a lot of this resides. So they're a great organization. Yeah. And you can also look at the American Library Association for statistics. This is a huge spike Mm -hmm. in banned books. It's been pretty steady, but it's shot through the roof in the last year. And it's definitely an organized effort. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Judy Bloom, always on the cutting edge, even back then. And one of the things she talked about that was so sweet is her early books, her mother typed. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she said, and she never said anything to me about the subject matter, (laughs) you know, which kind of surprised her. She's really darling, very intelligent and has changed the world. She really has. Part of me can't believe it's taken so long for a documentary to come out about her. But very grateful that one has. Maybe there's been a change because her books are also being produced as movies and yeah, s- serialized for television and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so cool. I heard Robin from Sacramento tweeted about how good it was, this documentary. So I can't wait to watch it. Well, one of the things, Chris, I forgot to talk about is they show her in the Beinecke going through the archives because her papers are now located at the Beinecke. And what she was going through is for years and years, kids have been writing to her and they even interview some of the kids now adults who wrote to her over the years, who some of them she got close with and one, she even went to her graduation and, you know, things like that. So So she reads some of the letters and she talks about the stress in some ways of getting them, but also how important, they are to her and are to the people who wrote them. That's amazing. That's yeah. fantastic. I remember when her papers were arriving, the Beinecke was sharing some stuff on social media. They were very excited about that. Yeah. So again, that movie is called Judy Bloom Forever, and it's on Amazon Prime. Well, the other biblio adventure I had was <laughs> doing a Jane Austen puzzle. Ooh, la la. That counts, right? Yeah. We have a very loose definition of biblio adventures, <laughs> but Laura was out of town. Emily was out of town. So I thought, well, what can I do that will get me up away from my desk and engage me in a different way and not looking at a screen because, you know, my eyes feel like they're twirling sometimes. So a puzzle, a Jane Austen puzzle. And I would get up from my desk periodically when my watch told me it was time to stand. And then I put my timer on for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes and work on it. So, so great. It was a lot of fun. My goal was to get the puzzle finished before Laura got home. She got an earlier flight home. There was a kerfuffle with a delay, but she ended up on an earlier flight. So I accomplished my goal two mm-hmm. hours earlier than planned. <laughs> Oh, so you knew she was coming home early, so you yeah, scrambled? I knew. I was like, oh, my God. And like, so she had texted me that she's in her car from the airport. And it's like an hour drive from the airport to our house. I was like, okay, you got to get this done. So I would like video, sped up you know. video of you trying to finish the puzzle at the last minute. So funny. Well, I was out of town because I was at the Newburyport Literary Festival. And I talked about that I was moderating a couple sessions which I've talked about at length already, so I'm not going to go into them too deeply, but I did. Everything went great. I talked to Dr. Karen Fine, veterinarian, about her book. The Other Family Doctor, a Veterinarian, Explores What Animals Can Teach Us About Love, Life, and Mortality. It was the 9 a.m. session, so I thought, oh, is anyone going to show up? And people did, and they came with great questions. But when I arrived, I was the first person there. And then one person walked in after me and it happened to be Karen's husband. (laughs) There's a point in the book where he proposes to her and he proposes to her with a ring made out of chocolate. So you all know me and food. I had to ask, did you make that ring? Like, did you do it yourself? And he said, yeah. And I said, did it take one try? What kind of chocolate was it? (laughs) What kind of a bar? Like big, little... So I cornered him right away and got the answer to that question. But then when Karen later arrived and we were sitting down and talking, I said, so what I really want to know is, did you eat the ring? (laughs) (laughs) And she said, no, I still have it 20 years later. And I was like, wow, I had this image of you that night kicking back on the couch and eating your (laughs) ring. So that was fun. She was very sweet. It was her first ever literary festival. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she did a great job. 
She brought swag and it was really sweet. Actually, I had run into her the night before and she said, you know, I brought things to give away. Is that okay? And I was like, of course, people will love it. So as she was signing books, she set out these little bags. One was with little doggy biscuits and then the other is for cats. And it had some sort of I haven't opened it because I actually took it to send to my daughter, but some sort of treat that cats like. And then a little cat shape post-it notepad and bookmarks. Cute. Yeah. Yeah. And the little bags have little paw prints on them. Paw prints. Yes. Very, very sweet. So thoughtful. Yeah. And then the other conversation was with Megan Marshall, who wrote the foreword for Three Roads Back by Robert D. Richardson, who was her mentor who passed away just as he was finishing this book. And this book is about Thoreau, Emerson, and James, and how they had early losses in their life that impacted their outlooks and the way that they chose to approach their writing and the way they lived their lives, really. There were some fun things that happened like in the book, which is only 100 pages, but a nine-year-old Louisa May Alcott knocks on the door at one point and Elizabeth Peabody shows up. So, (laughs) So cool. Yeah, it's a fun walk through history, but what he's really doing is using a term that he coined documentary biography, where he's acting as narrator, but using some of their words from their writings and their diaries and letters and things like that to tell the story he's trying to tell. So it was a really interesting approach. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. And Megan Marshall, when he first handed her this manuscript in 2019, was going through her own loss where her life partner had died very young. He was in his early 60s. So when he handed this to her, she was kind of hoping that it was a prescription of how do I get through this period of grief and then realized that you know wasn't really what it was. And then when she came back to read it through a period of going through her own grieving, she looked at it much differently when she sat down to write this forward. That too was very well attended with people asking really good questions. I did get a chance to also hop around a couple other little events that I wanted to talk about very quickly. And one of them was a short story panel with the authors Richard Rousseau, Peter Orner, Anne Hood, Andrew DeBoost III, moderated by Joshua Bodwell, who is the editorial director at Godine. And this is about a book called Reaching Inside, 50 acclaimed authors and 100 unforgettable short stories. Andrew DeBoos III reached out to 50 authors to ask them to write an essay about two short stories that had a huge impact on their life. And he was hoping that one of them might be an older short story and one more contemporary. I started reading it today. It's very interesting. And it's people like Ann Patchett, Meg Wolitzer, Tobias Wolf. I mean, these are heavy hitter writers. But he told a very cute story during this panel, which was that Joyce Carol Oates, she emailed back within five minutes, asked a few specific questions about what he wanted this essay to be like. And in 37 minutes, sent a perfect essay that they didn't have to edit at all. Oh my God. That is <laughs> mind blowing. That just doesn't seem humanly possible. I know. Isn't that? And he was like, other people, I was knocking on the email inbox three months in, you know, yeah. but like 37 minutes. That is amazing. Now, she is somebody I would love to just like shadow for a day. I can't imagine. She's so prolific mm-hmm. and responsive, obviously, yeah. and such yeah. a great mentor for people. Yeah. Two people, I should yeah. say. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I think it'd take me two months to pick the two stories. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd be like having to reread everything. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Reread the ones that got away and, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> overthinking. Yes. I also got to pop into a discussion between the author Camila Shamsi in conversation with Liberty Hardy. Liberty Hardy is a podcaster and part of the Book Riot team. She does a lot of writing for Book Riot. And Camilla Shamsi won the Women's Prize in 2018, but her current book is called Best of Friends. If you've seen it on the bookshelf, it has a really eye-catching cover. She was talking about that this is a story that takes place in two different time periods, and it's about people who become friends at a very young age and how those friendships you have when you're young are very different because you can grow up and 
be very different, you know, than when you first met and still maintain this friendship. Whereas the friendships you tend to choose when you're older, you have something in common is usually why you choose them. So it's a work of fiction, but she just said she wanted to look at that because she also noticed when she would get together with her childhood friends, they would laugh at things in a way that almost was reminiscent of childhood laughter Mm -hmm. that she wouldn't necessarily do with her adult friends. Now, that's not to say this isn't a work of nonfiction. You know, it's just an idea she wanted to explore Mm -hmm. in a piece of fiction. So it was an interesting conversation. I got to see our friend Karen, who's uh, from New Hampshire, who's going to be up at Booktopia. Very so, cool. Yeah. That's so awesome. we and her daughter, we sat together, which was really fun. It was supposed to be a rainy day. It ended up being a beautiful day, which was really nice because Newburyport is a great little town to walk around in. So we got lucky that way. Very cool. Yeah. And you were missed. Oh, I missed being there. Not that I've ever been there before. <laughs> you know, I would have loved to have been up there and been in the audience cheering you on and I always think next year I'll be able to go. Well, next year I'm not going to be in school. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. So talking about biography, I just have to share this thing for all the word nerds that are out there. When I was doing some cataloging work, the Library of Congress classification has all of these manuals to consult for different things. And there's one on biography. And I noticed the word biography ending with two E's. So Mm. like, it's the biography, the person who's the subject of the biography. And I'd never seen that word before. So I looked it up. I love when you look up on Google, it often gives you the usage of the word over time with this graph. So you could see if there's a bell curve, or if it's on the up or going down. That's always interesting. And then I discovered on Merriam Webster, they have this really cool feature called time traveler which tells you what year the word was coined, and then other words that were also coined that year. So biography with the two E's was established in 1841. Other words that first came into being that year were Americana, anti-corruption, anti-foreigner, central bank, characterization, challenging. Some of these words that I would assume would be there forever challenging. That's Hmm. such a surprise. But then other words like darkroom, that was first coined. And that's understandable, because that's when the technology of photography was first starting. So it's really neat. There are so many different words. There's one called free swimming, get by, joggernaut. So cool. So if you're a word nerd, check out Merriam Webster, and their time traveler feature, you'll spend probably (laughs) too much time and you might even find that you're late for things <laughs> or procrastinating from writing your final paper <laughs> and you got to go to Jabberwocky the oh, bookstore I did. yeah well I can't believe I didn't mention that yeah and I picked up the new copy of Plowshares which is edited by Alice Hoffman I'd been having green eyed envy with people posting about that all over social media it has a really beautiful cover it's sitting on my kitchen table Aww. at home. I'm sorry. I meant to ask you to bring it. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, she's, she was going to bring it. And then I forgot about it until just now. So. I totally forgot. I'll share it with you over the fence. And then I brought a beautiful box of cards. It's such a nice bookstore. I really enjoyed it. They had a cookbook section that I strolled through. The other thing they did that was fun, and boy, I could have bought a lot of books, is they had nice displays of all the books for the festival. Nice. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely store. Upcoming jaunts. Well, I'll be heading up to Vermont without my book bestie, Mm. unfortunately. Um, But I'm really looking forward to it. I'll talk about being missed. You'll definitely be missed Mm. on the drive up and hanging out around town. But that is going to be at the Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center in Vermont this weekend. Yeah, work caught up with me and I cannot do it, I'm afraid. I'm scheduled to go on May 17th, which... I guess is the week after this episode airs to Savoy Bookshopping Cafe at 6 p.m. The author Mary Beth Keen is going to be there. She wrote that book, Ask Again, Yes, that I loved. She's there with her new book, The Half Moon, which just published this week that I forgot to talk about when I read it a long time ago. I think it's one of those books I read and I was like, this is way too early. It's not fair to talk about it. So just briefly, I'll tell you it's about a married couple, Malcolm and Jess. 
Malcolm owns a bar. He worked there as a young man and kind of worked his way up. And then when the owner wanted to retire, he bought it from him. The bar is called the Half Moon. He's struggling now financially to keep it open. And his wife, Jess, is struggling unsuccessfully to have a baby. So there's a lot of tension in their marriage. And the book takes place over the course of one week when there's a huge blizzard. And Jess, the wife, leaves and partners up with another man. And there's a reason she does that, which I'm not going to mention because I don't want too many spoilers. At the same time, a longtime customer of the Half Moon disappears. And so that becomes a story arc in the book. The themes are about unrealized dreams, the meaning of family, and forgiveness and temptation. Mm -mm. And from a distance, I would also say the struggles of trying to keep a small business afloat and all of that. So again, that's called The Half Moon. I'm really excited to see her in person. That's cool. Yeah. And again, that's um, May 17th, 6 p.m. at Savoy Bookshop and Cafe. I can't believe we're already talking about the middle of May. I know. That's something else, isn't <laughs> know, it? It's crazy. Oh my gosh. I haven't been up to the Savoy in a long time. I know. Either. Me either. Well, if you want to come. Yeah, I'll have to check my calendar. Yeah. All I'd right. love to have you. That'd be fun. We could go work in a library. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> So upcoming reads, I think we have a joint read of the reading list by Sarah Nisha Adams. This is our second quarter read along. Yes, I'm super looking forward to diving into it this weekend. Yes. Our Zoom conversation is May 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Send us an email if you want to participate. I think we have a couple slots open. Cool. Well, the only other thing on my list, I mean, I have a note to self that I'm reading whatever I want. Graduation (laughs) is May 19th, so I will be a free range reader after that. And one of the things on the calendar that I just have on repeat every year, May 26th is World Dracula Day. So for those of you who like classics, if you haven't read Dracula yet by Bram Stoker, that could be a good day to kick off a reading of that. So I'm contemplating a reread, but we'll see. I'm not making any reading commitments you other could, than the read along. Yeah. That's it. You could go back to the Beinecke and stroke the covers of some <laughs> <laughs> first editions. <laughs> and then wash my hands. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Put on a mask and an, an asbestos <laughs> suit. <laughs> In the Out Now category, The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer publishes today, the day the episode airs. Loved that book. All right. Coming up next, enjoy our conversation with Sharon Salzberg. We're so excited to welcome New York Times bestselling author Sharon Salzberg, whose new book, Real Life, The Journey from Isolation to Openness and Freedom, is out now from Flatiron Books. Sharon is an internationally loved teacher of Buddhist meditation and psychology. She is a co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society, the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies, and host of the Meta Hour podcasts. In real life, Sharon teaches how to move from places of constriction and fear to expansion and compassion. In Sharon's own words, real life is about what happens when we fully engage with our everyday lives, whatever shape our lives take whatever challenges and obstacles that life may bring. Welcome, Sharon. We're so glad to have you here today. I'm so glad to be here. We were wondering, Real Life is your 12th book. Why did you start writing books? Why did I start writing books? Yeah, that's so interesting. I always wanted to be a writer as a child. I think if you'd asked me, what are you going to be when you grow up? Mostly I would have said writer or even playwright which hasn't happened yet. (laughs) Occasionally I'd say geneticist, which (laughs) popped into my head for some reason. But I never really quite thought I could. I had gone to India to learn meditation in 1970, began meditating in 1971. I went to Burma in 1985 to do this particular style of meditation called loving kindness and came back and started teaching it in the States. And People would ask me, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? And my colleagues, my male colleagues had all begun writing books. And I just didn't. And somebody said to me, you should probably write a book about loving kindness meditation because there isn't one and it would be new and different. And I thought about it in those days. 
I didn't have my own computer. Very, very few people did. And um, I was very intimidated. I thought I could never learn how to use a thing like that. So cutting and pasting, as you may recall, <laughs> meant getting a pair of scissors <laughs> and cutting out the paragraph you wanted to move and moving it up and down the page and then getting a roll of scotch tape and taping it somewhere. So it was a slow process. And uh, finally here in Barry at the Insight Meditation Society that Retreat Center I helped uh, co-found, we had a visit from a 94-year-old monk from Sri Lanka, and he mentioned that he was learning how to use a computer. And I thought, okay. <laughs> 94 years old, he's learning how to use a computer. Maybe I can too. And, and that, of course, made a big difference. And my first book was published in 1995. Oh, that's so great. I'm so grateful that you wrote that book. I remember reading it when it first came out. What struck me is it's a great book to begin with, but it was so important to find a woman writing about these things at the time, because so often it was male books, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as a woman, there was a different kind of connection and yeah. even a different kind of trust, I think, mm -hmm. with that. So Emily and I both had this question. You talk about when you first started meditating and studying when you were 18 and how you got angry and you said, you know, this is not working. And you weren't an angry person before all this started. So we're wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and how change can bring about anger and mm -hmm. how you work through that. Well, I think it was more that I, I didn't realize I was an angry person. <laughs> you know, I was 18. I had this intense conviction. I had to learn how to meditate, which was born in taking this Asian philosophy course for the university. And I really took that course that particular philosophy course, because it fit nicely in my schedule. <laughs> and it was in the context of the course I heard about meditation. And I was going to college in Buffalo, New York. And I looked around Buffalo. This is 1970. I did not see it anywhere. And I created this independent study project and presented it to the university saying, I want to go to India and learn how to meditate. And they said, they said, okay, so off I went. You know, I'd had, like many people do, a very chaotic, traumatic childhood. You know, lots of death, lots of loneliness and anxiety, all kinds of things. And like for many people, mine was a family system where this was never, ever spoken about. And so I went off to India with all of these things inside of me, never having really been looked at. I knew I was quite unhappy, which was the impetus for going, but I couldn't have painted a picture of my emotional landscape to you realistically. And I had never been in therapy. I'd never journaled or done kind of things of introspection. And there I was looking within, practicing meditation. And there were all those feelings. And <laughs> so, you know, the context of that story, as I usually tell it, is I went marching up to my teacher, my first meditation teacher, whose name was S.N. Goenka, and said, I never used to be an angry person before I started meditating, thereby laying blame on him, because clearly it was all his fault <laughs> that I was feeling this. And he just laughed, you know, because clearly it was not his fault. And it took a while for me to understand it's important not only to see these things, these forces, these habits, these patterns, but to see them in a different way with more presence, more balance, more kindness toward myself. And that was actually the healing. It's hard for people, I think, when they hear about meditation, they get an impression like it's going to be like maybe a little bit of a struggle. And then there's like this unfathomable peace. And then there's bliss shimmering around the edges of the peace. And sometimes it's like that. And sometimes you're restless and sometimes you're sleepy. And sometimes very ancient anger comes <laughs> forward and it's all good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I really appreciated about the book was when you talk about the concept of storytelling, because I think when you're in those families where things are unspoken, you start to make things up. Or you believe certain things that may not be true. And that's where then the constriction comes. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think we do make up that story that may not be true. We certainly we make up stories about others. Like, surely it's all perfection inside that household. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing ever goes wrong there. I am the only one mm. is a story. Or this is all that I'll ever feel is a story. 
And then even more insidiously, maybe they're the stories others make up about us, about who we are. Yeah. You know, this was a long time ago. Like, divorce was not that common in those days, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do have... I did have a father with a severe mental illness. So there was all of that and the stigma surrounding that. And, you know, between the stories society would tend to tell and the stories I made up in my mind about how perfect everyone else's life was. And of course, I think the almost inevitable story for a child in a situation like mine is this is my fault somehow. Yeah. You know, it was quite a bundle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Went off to India with. Yeah. And then some of the anger is, you know, you've been giving that so much space in your head. Yeah. Right. The ownership of space. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about craving and urging? One of the concepts I loved was when you talked about how craving is actually a love of life. Mm -hmm. That is not typically what people think about with craving. (laughs) Tell us about that. Well, if you look at the Buddhist psychology, they talk about three main roots of the suffering we feel, the unhappiness we feel every day, one degree or another. One is craving, one is aversion, which is anger or fear, and the other is delusion, which in this context is kind of like being numb, being spaced out, not really feeling, not tuning in. It's also true that, it is said, within each of these is kind of a jewel And it gets distorted, it gets weird, because it also gets associated with other things, like with craving, it might get associated with a specific experience or person or uh, object. Like, if only I had this, I would be perfectly happy forever. Mm -hmm. You know, so we start kind of storing up experiences and people and objects as totems against change to defy the truth of change, which it can't. Or we start to cling. I can't allow this to ever be marred. I can't allow this person to ever change. I can't allow this experience to fade. And it's always going to fade. And people are going to change. And objects are going to break. I think, I don't know anybody, I don't think, who has bought a new car without having some boo-boo happen to it, you know, (laughs) one way or another very quickly. Things change. Um, But... Underneath that, if we cannot get caught in all of that, trying to control and trying to keep and so on, trying to accumulate, is this love of life, wanting to experience fully, not holding back, not being apart from, you know, and that that's the jewel that's in there. And with aversion, especially the form of anger. And it's interesting to me, it's always been interesting that anger and fear are considered the same mind state. Mm. And that psychological system, just two different forms. Anger being the outgoing, energized, expressive form. Fear being the held in, frozen, imploding form of striking out against what's happening. Wanting, in many cases, to declare it to be untrue. And the jewel within the anger is, first of all, energy. You know, we need energy to stand up for ourselves, for others, for, you know, for change, to draw a boundary and all of that. And also sometimes a kind of courage is kind of a, the way I put it sometimes it's like, sometimes we count on the angry person in the meeting mm. <laughs> be the truth teller. Yes. <laughs> you know, like there's a hole in the carpet and everyone else is studiously looking in another direction, like anywhere <laughs> but at that hole. And then there's this person saying, look at that hole. You know, like, <laughs> so we kind of rely on that as well. And so, uh, That's the jewel is that cutting through social nicety and appearances and it's like a kind of discriminating wisdom. And so we want that without all the burning and the, you know, one of the ways anger is sometimes described in that psychology is being like a forest fire, which can burn up its own support. You know, so it's not a question of whether we feel anger or not, because we feel what we feel, but when we're consumed by it, when we're lost in it, when it becomes like a chronic state, it can burn up its own support, which is us, <laughs> you know, we're the host and we could be damaged terribly by that. And yet we want that energy. We want that positive part. And then just to finish the system, 
with delusion, which is this kind of nice cocoon of not knowing what's going on. There's a certain equanimity there. There's a certain evenness or balance there. And if you can have that with a much more greater perception of what's actually happening instead of being so spaced out, you can have that kind of evenness without the rest of it. So they also talk about sometimes people have like a predominant tendency. We all have all three. And they're not judgment worthy. You know, like most of them are picked up. Most of those habits are picked up. At a time, they were very useful. Like, there were a lot of times in my life it was quite useful to go numb and yeah, really very useful. It's just like, I'm not nine anymore, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, or 11. I'm a lot older than that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want some options in how I react to things, not to have this kind of go-to place, you know. Yeah. It right. just takes over. And so that's that's what happens. And so for me, sometimes they do say that, even though we all have all three, sometimes we tend to have more of one. So I definitely have a lot of delusion of that kind of, you know, let's just take a nap. Right. <laughs> Deal with it another time. You know, like, yeah. There's no, there's no hole that. in the carpet. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. No hole in the carpet. What carpet? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things about this book and your work in general is that it is real to use that word in real life. And one of the things that really popped out to me, I listened to the audio book, which is great. And I really enjoyed listening to you read it. But you talk about pride as a positive thing, which I think is so different than other Buddhist things I've read or attitudes or assumptions about what it is to practice a Buddhist psychology or, Mm -hmm. you know, even in other faith traditions you know, mm-hmm. pride is always presented as such a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But you talk about it in a very different way. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Well, to some extent, really, the phrase I would more tend to use would be something like self-respect, which is considered very positive, because what is the opposite of that? Just demeaning ourselves and feeling we're worthless or feeling we did something bad, and that's all who we are? You know, the worst thing we've ever done or that change isn't happening, that possibility is not happening. So that makes no sense, really. I also was looking at the work of Barbara Fredrickson, who's a research psychologist in the uh, University of North Carolina who studies positive states, including love and kindness, which is how we met. And, and she uses the word pride as a positive state. So I really tried to think through what she meant. And the way she describes positive states is not just like a feel-good time, you know? But she has this theory, it's called the Fredrickson Theory of Broaden and Build. Like if we cultivate one of these states, loving kindness, gratitude, generosity, it broadens our perspective. And that made a lot of sense to me. Like, Because when we're trapped in fear, trapped in rage, not just feeling it, but really feel trapped in it, the world closes down, you know? We feel so tight and constricted, and no options, and here we are. And so it made sense to me the opposite would be like, whoa, you know, much more open and expansive. And she also talks about build, which is that if we cultivate these states, we build a sense of inner resource. We build acquaintance with our inner strength so that when we then meet adversity or a challenge, we don't feel like we're going to that situation with nothing going, you know, like, We have a sense of wherewithal, of of resource. And she uses pride. And I looked at it and I kept thinking, that's self-respect. Because interestingly, in, in the Buddhist sense of morality, it's a lot about, certainly it's about compassion for others, but it's a lot about self-respect. Like, you know, not feeling as we can often feel, you know, like, Ooh, you know, like, what if anybody found out? (laughs) I did that thing or I cheated on my taxes, which I don't. Or, or, you know, uh, there's so many things that are not obvious, but we know. You know, that we were deceptive or we were not forthcoming or, you know, whatever it was. And if you practice introspection, I think of any kind, you start to see it like it didn't just disappear. 
you know, you're developing that habit of hiding, having secrets, you know, like, it's not that good. And that state of self-respect is, is, again, it's like, it expands our perspective. And it gives us a sense of wherewithal so we can meet challenge instead of feeling like I'm so loathsome and unworthy. You know, it's like, hey, I did the best I could, you mm-hmm. know, and yeah. that's my goal in life. Yeah. And that is loving kindness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that's great about this book is all throughout you mention people that you've come into contact with and you use their, their examples. And when Chris and I were comparing notes, um, we both, you know, were like all hail bell hooks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and one of the things I loved, it was when you talked about scattered heart energy and it made me think of the concept of like civic love mm-hmm. that when this broader love, mm-hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah, well, Belle actually was a friend of mine and uh, oh, wow. a very beloved friend of mine. And we had, you know, I grew up in New York City. I went to college in Buffalo. I went to India for years, came back. I started teaching, traveling all over the place. I helped establish the retreat center here in Barry, And then I was working on a book called Faith. And uh, somebody offered me their apartment in New York City for three months. So it was my return to... New York as an adult. And I met Belle then and, and we were hanging out and, you know, got to be friends and which was amazing, you know, for me, it was really awesome. And then she moved back to Kentucky and we, we just lost touch for a very long time. And then um, I was, you know, I, I started staying in New York more and more, finally rented an apartment or I'd go back and forth and travel. And something happened in my apartment in the building, like there was no water, some New York thing, you know. Like, <laughs> so I checked into a, a nearby hotel, and there was Belle in the lobby. Oh. And so we we reunited, and we got, you know, we started spending time together whenever she came to New York. And, and I went to Kentucky a few times, you know, uh, to see her or teach in her institute or something. And um, and certainly she taught me a lot about that notion of a, a kind of collective loving kindness. and. You know, most people I would teach following the kind of trajectory I I felt I followed myself could see the dawning of like a greater good heartedness in their being through the process of paying more attention and uh, doing these different practices. But not many people would necessarily think about systems change. You know, and so the common example would be someone would come to me and say, uh, I was taking a walk and somebody came up to me and asked me for a dollar. And I gave them a dollar because that's my my habit. But it was the first time I ever looked this kind of person in the eye and realized this is a human being. Mm. But not many of those people would necessarily go on to say, I wonder what the housing policy is in this city. So there's so many people on the street, you know, and um, and there's some people like Belle who are real leaders and saying, that's beautiful. Don't denigrate that personal response and the genuine transformation you've been going through. And what about this? You know, let's look at this. Let's look at uh, the status of women in this group, in this organization. Let's look at race. Let's look at, you know, all of these kind of systemic issues. Yeah. What a, what a great story that you got reunited again. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the part that, you know, sometimes we talk about is uh, she didn't, I don't even know if she, I think she did by the end own, own a computer, but she didn't do email. Wow. And she didn't even have a cell phone. She borrowed a neighbor's cell phone when she came <laughs> to New York. So there's always a different phone number. <laughs> you get this calling. I wonder who that is, you know? <laughs> Great. So you had to like write her a letter, you know. <laughs> oh, which is so That's lovely. Yeah. I love yeah. the idea of that. Yeah. yeah for sure. <laughs> um, can we can we talk about grief and resilience? Mm-hmm. But but I also, as I was reading about that, I was thinking about carrying on this idea of the of civic love, but also that we're coming out of this time of collective grief with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. 
How is that affecting the work you're doing with people and just your own being? Well, I think, you know, I and, and we are really just at the beginning of comprehending, you know, mm. what what has happened and, and uh, for many people. And clearly, you know, it hasn't been the same for everybody, but it's pretty significant in terms of change and loss and so on. Uh, some years ago, I'd read, somebody had written that grief is love without the ordinary place to land. Mm. You know, the person's gone or the situation's gone or the promise is gone. Something has disappeared in a way, but the love is still there. Mm. And so I think there's a kind of healing in uh, both understanding that, you know, and focusing on on the love and also realizing that, you know, there was a loneliness epidemic, people said, before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I used, used to read like about these different clinical conditions and how social connection could make a difference. And, and I think, well, it can't just be a numbers game, you know, like I only have three friends, I need eight in order to be safe, you know. Mm -hmm. It must be some inner sense of feeling connected. And I think that's important to understand. You know, if we didn't care, we wouldn't grieve, but Let's also focus on on this greater sense of belonging, of connection, of of being part of things that part of life, which I think is very, very important. You know, I think another truth, and, and this is also in this this current book, is that culturally and for many people, we don't know how to grieve. Mm -hmm. You know, the mainstream society doesn't like it much and I've had people go through unthinkable kinds of loss, you know, and have friends more or less say, hurry up, you know, right. like, yeah, yeah. Or, or our employers who say, you know, get back to work tomorrow. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So kind of forming your own community, even if it's not in person, like in the same room seems to be an important element in, in allowing one to feel what we feel. Yeah. yeah. Well, and your book is certainly a help with that, with helping people live more, you know, expansive lives in that way, internally and with other people. And so yeah. thank you. Yeah. Understanding reactions to these feelings, yes. you know, that's so much of the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and that our feelings are what makes us human. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, we have them for a reason. So, yeah. 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 So Sharon, we know that our time is kind of... Um, coming to an end here but we always like to ask writers if if you're willing to talk about it what are you working on next in terms of <laughs> writing projects <laughs> um not a book right now i have another book coming out in october oh wow nice. which is different it's a it's a gift book it's illustrated i've never done one before and uh, I actually did it before real life because here I was, you know, not traveling at all after a life, you know, of like constant travel and uh, not teaching in person, but teaching online a lot. And uh, my life was so different and I really felt for people. And so there's that. What comes after that? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to... Um, my childhood aspiration of being a playwright. I don't even know if I knew what that was. I must have read about it somewhere. And I thought, maybe I'll try to write a play. Oh, <laughs> like, wow. I, I have yeah. a feeling I will write something. Oh, that's cool. great. All right. Well, we're oh. going to definitely keep an eye on your social media and your website yeah. and, yeah. and uh, for any kind of news coming out about that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe I'd take us out with, um, in the appendix of the book, Sharon has some lovely items, including the loving kindness meditation. So if, um, if it'd be okay with you, I thought I would just read that. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Thank you so much, Sharon, for your time. Thank you. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, 
or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.